Yeah, it's got the coolest hair. Did you know what? I want to share a confession for you. When I was um, 10 years old, let me look around here. <laughs> Tabitha, stand up. Stand up. That's how long my hair was. <laughs> Tabitha, stand up. How old are you? <laughs> Tabitha had her 50th birthday this week. like that. <laughs> you just have to be one of them. <laughs> I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the prophet Isaiah. It's an Old Testament book. Uh, if, you, uh, if you're not sure how to find your way around, open it up in the middle and turn right. It shouldn't be far from there. Specifically chapter 9 of Isaiah. Uh, how many of you have had the privilege of singing Handel's Messiah somewhere along the line? Have you? You've certainly invariably heard it. You, 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 I hope you would know the tradition that uh, when the Hallelujah Chorus comes on, um, everyone is supposed to stand during that part. Uh, that actually was started very spontaneously uh, by, the, by the King of England, who uh, was so moved through the presentation of the, of the whole of Handel's Messiah that when the Hallelujah Chorus came on, and King of Kings and Lord of Lords was being sung by the, the choir. Uh, he, he stood, of course, when the king stood, everybody stood. And so that tradition has endured for all of these years now. Much of, uh, Isaiah, of Handel's uh, lyrics for the Messiah are drawn from various passages in Isaiah, including the passage that we are in today. And uh, I, when I was doing some preparation ahead of time, and uh, reading uh, and, and you know, getting ready for this message, I found kind of a fun article where the, uh, the, the title of the article was, It's Handel's Fault. And um, he was basically saying that there are some parts of this that are so familiar to us that when we hear them, we just kind of move into autopilot and just assume that we know what it's talking about. Uh, we do that an awful lot with parts of the Gospels uh, in the New Testament. Uh, you know, we just have heard some of these stories and things so many times over the course of our life that as soon as we hear for God so loved the world, we're just kind of transported to someplace else. And even if the preacher were to teach something that you'd never heard before, you probably don't actually hear what he's saying because the reflex is to hear what we've always heard. And uh, it, it is probable that uh, if you have any familiarity with Handel's Messiah or if you've been hanging around church for any number of years at Christmas time when these passages begin to be focused upon, that you just automatically step into uh, an assumption that you know what's going on. And I, I hope that is the case, I hope that it's accurate, but I want to take some time today to talk about this passage in Isaiah from which some very familiar pass uh, passages are drawn at this time of the season. So let me read for you beginning in chapter 9 and verse 1, and uh, I'll read uh, just without, without stop, and, and you can follow along or, or listen. Nevertheless, by the way, when you start a phrase with nevertheless, you obviously refer, know that he's referring to something before that. We'll go back in a few moments to see what he's referring to. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom. For those who were in distress in the past, he humbled. Uh, in, let me start again. Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for, for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by way of the sea and along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Of those living in the shadow, in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at a harvest or as men rejoice when dividing plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them. They bar across their shoulders the rod of their oppressors. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. 
For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish uh, this. We'll stop there. For unto us a child is born. When we uh, get in the earliest years after the life of Jesus, when he led his disciples in and around the regions surrounding Jerusalem and ultimately to the city of Jerusalem. And as the peoples began to follow him in earnest and great numbers grew, and then after his death and his resurrection and the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit upon his followers and the church began to grow, when the New Testament began to be formulated as, as persons diligently sought to make sure that they got the historical record accurate and began to record the Gospels with all the teachings that Jesus had brought to them and, and all the historical interactions that he had with his people. And as the Apostle Paul begins to write and, and to spread the news around his mission field throughout the Mediterranean, the Christian community at that time who were largely born out of the Jewish community and who had a familiarity with the Old Testament and specifically a familiarity with the prophetic words of God when he said that someday I will send my deliverer, there will be Messiah for you. The Christian community began to look at these various prophetic announcements of God's inevitable coming and began to see in Jesus fulfillment of this and fulfillment of that and fulfillment of this and began to be this overwhelming sense that God had promised us for many, many, many hundreds of years, and here we are living in that day. And this passage was one that really grabbed their attention because of the, because of the focus upon the child coming, and that it was going to be through a child that the Deliverer or the Messiah would be made known and given to the people. Now, that's where you and I start with, generally speaking, as, as, as part of the Christian era and, and as those who have studied the New Testament, we read this passage now and we automatically click into, oh good, there's a prophecy of Jesus. But when this was written, it is almost a certainty that the original hearers would not have been able to frame their mind around the idea that God was going to save them by a baby. In fact, even today, that is a point of stumbling for Jews who are anxious for a Messiah and who will look to the Old Testament pro prophecies for what Messiah will be. And this idea from the Christian community that, no, he came as a child, still something that the Jewish community would, would struggle with. Because when they read that, they don't necessarily understand that a child referenced here is literally a child. In fact, Isaiah uses the metaphor or the reference of a child three times or in three spaces within uh, short order in this passage. In chapter 7, there's another uh, part of the scripture that we, uh, that we read often. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and we will call him Emmanuel. You've heard that, haven't you? It's almost hard for us to imagine that, well... Obviously, God is promising that his deliverer is going to be born. child will know him from his, infant, from his infancy. But, but these earliest readers didn't catch that right away. And then in chapter 11, while not necessarily referencing uh, the, the Messiah, there is, uh, again, the use of the imagery of a child as, as one through whom God's grace is going to be outpoured. That's what's going on historically at this time. Uh, what we usually referred to as, as Israel, by this time is actually divided into two kingdoms. There's two kings. And uh, in, in the north is uh, what is referred to still as Israel, but actually the city of Jerusalem is in the southern part called Judah. And there's a new capital that's been established in the northern part of the kingdom, uh, and that is, of all places, Samaria. And if you are familiar with some of the New Testament and, and Jesus' interaction with Samaritans and how, how there was such disdain for that part of the region, it isn't it interesting that Samaria actually served as the capital for the northern kingdom for, for many years. Now, 
Let me see if I can do this backwards. So, so, so you have the, the northern kingdom of Israel, Judah. Uh, up here is a growing power called Assyria. Now, Assyria has always been uh, uh, very influential in the whole of the region and uh, was exerting its influence. And we're a feisty group and, and a, a warring group. Uh, just below Assyria and to the east is uh, Aram. Aram and Israel really didn't like each other at all. And they often were at battle with one another. And if you go through the Old Testament, you can find all kinds of incursions that are going back and forth. The problem for both Israel and Aram is that Assyria is gaining force and gaining influence. And so um, you could call Israel and Aram frenemies. Right? They really didn't like each other, uh, but so that they could sort of keep tabs on Assyria's growing power, they cooperated together all the time. And so when this is being written by the prophet Isaiah, um, that's kind of the geopolitical thing going on for this people. They, they're, they're separated from Jerusalem, they're separated from, from you know, their kin in the south. They've got this you know, uncomfortable relationship with Aram and the threat of Assyria marching upon them. This is about 750 BC. 100 years later, Assyria, in fact, would, would spread through the whole region and the exile of the Jews to Babylon would become uh, the, the most obvious expression for the Jews. Already, God is warning this people that through, through prophet Isaiah and, 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 and Micah and others, that, uh, listen, they need to, they need to get their, their sense of allegiance to the Lord God Almighty back in order, back, back, back focused upon Him, because if they do not, these forces are going to play out and, and, and you will be sacked. Sometimes, you know, a bit of a theological discussion that we won't settle today is, is this whole question of, well, 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 did God send the Babylonians to ultimately take out Israel and, and, and then into Judah, or, or, or did it just happen as a consequence and God was able to project that, listen, if you don't, this, this is what's going to happen. I'm persuaded, actually, that the more often than not, prophetic uh, fulfillment, if you would, is, is the outpouring of what will obviously happen if we do not live the way we are supposed to live. And God warned the people. And he warned them through a passage like we just looked at today. And it is filled with all kinds of extraordinary promise. The first part where I read to you where, where it talked about the, the, the garments that were rolled in blood and, and, and the weapons, that they're all going to be destined for the fire. There they, they, they will be no more. It's, it, it's going to be a time of peace. In my preamble for the lighting of the candles today, we, we caught that Jesus calls his followers to be peacemakers. If you joined us uh, on last Wednesday in our Bible study, we focused upon that a, a great deal. We, we saw from the uh, Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, that Jesus goes through these beatitudes and he describes these incredible contrite and humble attitudes that, are, that his people are, that he expects of his people. And then he says, blessed are the peacemakers, for yours is the kingdom of God. And then he goes into these examples of things about how, how that actually works out. And he talks about this desire to, to, to murder someone or even to think it in our heart. And, and, and it's all this pattern of, of self-sacrifice. And he says you, you need to have a righteousness that is expressed in these kinds of attitudes and actions of humility and submissiveness and kindness and gentleness. And it needs to be far greater than the, the, than the Pharisees who are the ones teaching you. And, and so it, what we saw on Wednesday was that Jesus in this task for realizing world peace actually pulls it right down and shoves it right into our responsibility as individuals. And my first task is to be at peace with you and you with me and with my neighbor and with my friends. And, and, and that, that is actually Jesus prescription for how we would effect peace throughout the world. Now today and then in this passage of Isaiah, this notion of peace was overwhelmingly being hung on the choices and the decisions and the influence of the kings. 
We can keep Assyria at bay if we have this uneasy alliance with Aram here, but we'll just trust that the kings will play that card carefully. Maybe someday we'll get the better of them again, but right now we've got to keep Assyria at play. And so we're looking for our kings to make all of these right decisions and, and, and expecting that if need be, our military forces will be energized and activated and they'll go and do the battle for us. And if they win, we'll live in peace. And I would suggest to you that we're really not very far removed from that anymore. As we pay our dues into NATO and as we continue this relationship with the United States, which, if you haven't noticed, is becoming a little uneasy again. And we think about the issue of peace in our world and in our time. And we look to the prime ministers and we look to the presidents and we look to the kings and queens and we hope that they will make the right choices, that they will keep their alliances sufficient, that, that if need be, the armies will be activated and they'll beat down the bad guy and we'll get to live in peace. It's funny how 2,750 years doesn't really teach us very much, does not it? Just as Jesus teaching his followers said, listen, what I expect is for peace to begin with you. So God, through the prophet Isaiah, is painting a picture that they never, ever could have wrapped their brain about and these many years later still struggle with. When he says in the, in the wake of this promise of, of, the, of the tools of war being, being thrown into the fire, you're thinking, cool, how's that going to happen? And through the prophet, God says, for to us a child is born. To us a son is given. Unless there be any mistake, he says, the government will be on his shoulders. What does that mean? I mean the, the political machinations that we see today? No, no, no authority. The ability to direct nations to direct peoples will be on his shoulders. He will be called the Wonderful Counselor. He will be Mighty God. He is the Everlasting Father. And for our focus today with the candle of peace and the whole conversation that I'm having with you, he is the Prince of Peace and of the increase of his government and of his peace there will be no end. No more pushing and shoving of nation against nation. Even this day, in the wake of all of the newscasts and the stuff floating through social media, and all of the angst that is emerging in the hearts of the people of our nation. To suggest to someone, hey, you know what? You want to know the way to peace? The way to peace is to put your trust in a child. <coughs> that, that is laughed at. That is scoffed. That is mocked. And the laughing and the scoffing and the mocking is so severe and so continuous and so consistent that isn't it just kind of a reflex that is not so far removed from any of us to begin to think, yeah, we're never going to find that peace. We're never going to know that peace. Or last week we talked about the kingdom of God. We talked about uh, the, this, this picture that said that um, our hope is in the person of Jesus. We said and saw uh, in Peter's writings that, said that God is being patient. He's, he's waiting. His return is imminent, but it's, it's, it's being delayed because God is not willing that any should perish. And so then he says, get your acts together. Begin to focus upon honoring God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. And in so doing so, because others will be drawn to Jesus, we would expedite or speed up his return. 
It's an extraordinary passage of scripture and one that runs at odds with a whole lot of dispensational teaching that happens that tries to define these, like these really strict categories of this must happen for a thousand years and then this will happen and then this will happen and then the Lord will return. Like, like that's fascinating stuff except you have to square it with what the scripture says in other places. And when Peter seems to paint this nebulous thing that says, listen, he's ready to come, but he's waiting. And he's waiting so that as many people as possible will come into fellowship with him and know peace and know life. And if we would be earnest and intentional and busy about proclaiming Christ, we actually then can speed up his return. Why? Because more and more will have come into his fold. Now, now I'm not throwing the whole dispensational conversation out. But you can't throw out that passage either that says that we, you and I, can play a role in expediting the return of Jesus. But the way it works is that we have to stop putting our hope in princes, in prime ministers, in presidents, in kings and queens. They are not our hope. They never have been. Our hope is about as far removed as royalty as it can get. Our hope, and the hope for peace, rests in a child born as vulnerable as any child can be. We've got some new babies around these days. When my first son was born, he was a month early, so he was, a, he was just a little peanut. He was a small guy. And I watched the nurses come into the room and they'd scoop him in one hand and they'd do what they did over here and they'd, they'd, they'd put him back in. Zip, 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 you know, they're fast. And I thought, okay, I've got to do that myself. If they can do it, I can do it. So I tried really early to try to you know, do the one-handed thing with my son. I actually figured it out. I was pretty good at it. I kind of like to show it off a little bit. Somebody come in the room, hold my child with one hand, right? Why could I do that? I could do that because he was small and vulnerable. You know what else I could have done with this hand? If I wanted to, I could have crushed him. Here was this child, just pathetically dependent upon every measure of life <coughs> upon those who would care and give him life. The king is going to save us. The great powerful leaders are going to save us. They're going to make sure that peace rules in our day. We'll just have a few more guns than another guy and he won't ever dare to fight us. And God says, guess what? I'm going to save you through someone who has no power at all. That makes no sense at all. And so it didn't make any sense in this day either for them to literally receive this as a prophecy of a baby. And yet this is ultimately what it meant. It was ultimately God saying, listen, you have got it all backwards. And if you don't get it sorted out, you're going to reap the rewards of your misunderstanding. And 100 years later, that would happen to Israel, where their nation would be sacked and their greatest leaders would be taken away from the from the, from the centers of their, of their influence and power. And for 70 years, they would live as a displaced people with no sense of identity and no sense of the hope that there would ever be resurrection or, or restoration again. Why? Because they continued to trust that somehow their leadership was going to be the ones who would guide and usher in peace. And we're making the same mistake this day. I see it all around. I watch my brothers and sisters in the Lord doing hysterical backflips about which political leaders they should be voting for, and it goes from both sides. And it's as if you vote for that person, oh my word, the, the world's going to end. Don't you know we have to vote for this one or it's all going to blow up? And folks, that is as wrong today as it was wrong then. The hope of peace is in the one who would come. It's Jesus, the incarnate God, 
who would then grow up and teach and direct his followers to adopt what? Attitudes of strength and power and influence? No, no, no. Attitudes of vulnerability. It says, you want to hit me in the face? Okay, go ahead. Hit my other side too. And that's the kind of attitude that he says will actually usher in peace. And when you go to think about it, actually, right? Yeah, go ahead. I've got another side too. Yeah. It's actually rather peaceful when you think about it. So that's, that's quite extraordinary when it, when it talks about being compassionate and, and, and broken for other broken people. You're, you're all of a sudden beginning to displace all these patterns of domination and influence that, that, that usher in the lack of peace. We begin to displace discord and hatred with the love of Jesus. For to us a child is born, and he will be called the Prince of Peace, and he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it with with justice and with righteousness from that time and, and forever. And I can't even say that without Hamilton's aside beginning to sing in my brain. Forever, 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 forever. Right? You know that, that, that you can know peace. Paul would begin to describe it in terms that were very, very personal and, and very, very intimate. In Philippians, when he talks about a peace which passes understanding. You understand that, that when this is written, that there's this, I talked about it, this uneasy tension with Aram, but they're not fighting. And they're worried about Assyria, but they're not there yet. I mean, they live without warfare, but there's no peace in the land. And today, in 2018, almost 19, except that we share some of our peacekeeping forces to other lands, we, 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 there's no warfare for Canada. I'm not certain, though, that we live in peace. Anxiousness, hatred, fears. Jesus' kingdom is so upside down, so beautiful. Being the top dog will never filter down to a place of rest and peace within my soul. But knowing that God loves me through His Son and that I have been received as His child and my sins are forgiven and that I am at peace with the Almighty God of the universe and that through His grace I can be at peace with you and you and you and you and my family and my neighbors and my neighbors' neighbors. The, 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 this, this prevailing sense that everything is actually okay in spite of what may be happening over there. I'm okay. I'm good. I'm at peace. We're at peace. That is the promise of Messiah. That's the promise of Christ. That is what Christmas is. Christmas, Christ's coming. So if there's any kind of a practical lesson to be drawn from this today, you know, if you're a political junkie, go for it. Have fun. But if you get yourself so convinced that that leader or that leader is the one who's going to be the one who's going to retain peace in this world, you've, you've lost it again. You've lost it again. Your hope, our hope, my hope is in Jesus, the one who came as a child, who grew in that vulnerable setting and became this wonderful, extraordinary teacher who continued to teach the principles of what it meant to be a child. And until you and, I, you and I forsake looking for external forces to control peace in our lives, we'll never know peace. It is within our control, it's within my control, and it is simply this. Will I submit myself to Jesus even as he submitted himself for the whole of humanity? He's the Prince of Peace. 
And he wants to be the Prince of Peace in your life. And he can be, and he would be. And when he becomes the Prince of Peace in your life, it will not matter what happens around you. It will not matter. It, it, it can be messy, it can be frightening, it can be all that stuff, but there would prevail in your heart and your mind this sense that all is well because I am at peace with God. That's the invitation of Christmas. Let's pray. <coughs> Lord God, as, as my mind just continues to race, I, we present ourselves to you as um, very blessed and privileged people. Not long ago, Lord, we, um, we had a Remembrance Day celebration where we acknowledged those who fought in bloody wars. to maintain peace, the absence of warfare. We know, Lord God, that warfare and battling has always been part of our history and may very well be part of our future. But I thank you, God, for the gift of your Son. And that your intentions towards your creatures has never changed. That you have always meant for us to walk in relationship with you with an innocence like unto that which your first creatures Adam and Eve walked. A relationship of trust and vulnerability. And so Lord, in spite of the circumstances of my life and of the nation in which I live, I submit myself to you. I surrender to you. You who came in the most vulnerable of ways. Would you by your grace help me in my heart and in my mind and in the very core of my being become likewise childlike. In my surrender to your lordship and kingship, O Prince of Peace. Because of your salvation, I pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Stand again as we sing, even so come. Wake up the saint.
our gathering next Saturday, 6 p.m. Hope that you'll join us. And if you can't bring a dessert, that would be great. But all that aside, your Prince of Peace stands with you. He has saved you. He is preparing you and making you fit for the day when you will enter into his presence either because we will be standing here when he returns and we rise to meet him in the air or because our breath in this life will come to its end and yet even so we will enter his presence. He is preparing you for that. But his kingdom is meant to rule and reign right now. I am a Canadian, but more than that, I am a child of the kingdom of God. And my king is a vulnerable child who expects me to adopt the same habits, the same patterns, the same attitudes, the same demeanor, the same temperament as the one who gave his life. And amazingly, when I do that, the Prince of Peace becomes real in my life. Let's go. Let's go be peacemakers with our friends, our family. Our neighbors, there may be some people in your life right now with whom you are estranged. Maybe that's where we begin as peacemakers. Father, may the blessing of your Holy Spirit continue upon your people as we move now from this place, this sacred place of worship, into the days of the week. May the whole of our life be an expression of worship for you. Jesus' name. Amen.